Dr. Hargrove, thank you so very much for agreeing to be a part of this project and this interview. On behalf of the Lucy Craft Laney Museum of Black History, Mustard Seed Video Production, and the Watson Brown Foundation, we are here today to talk with Dr. Faye Hargrove. My first question for you is, where are you from? Okay, may I thank you first and say I'm so honored to be asked um, to be a part of this history project. I never thought of myself as part of history, but this is a great affirmation, validation. Thank you. I am originally from Eatonton, Georgia. That's Putnam County in Middle Georgia. Um, Alice Walker is from, who wrote The Color Purple. That is her hometown. Um, graduated from Putnam County High School in class of 1975. Um, actually, my father was in the Air Force, so we moved around a lot and um, lived, I moved almost every two years going to a different school. But my family in Putnam County goes back five generations to the plantation. Uh, my great-great-grandfather was William Oscar Culp on the Culp Plantation in Putnam County. And when we have family reunions, we're told of how he was sitting on the fence when the Union soldiers came through. Um, and that's how he learned that, um, that um, slavery was over. It was kind of like his Juneteenth, but it, it wasn't on, on Juneteenth. Um, and so um, five generations on both sides go back to Putnam County. So in light of that, you obviously have so much history connected to Georgia. Um, were there any influential people, educators, or family members for you growing up where you decided early on what field you would study or whether you would go to college at all? Okay, so going to college or not going to college really wasn't um, something that took a lot of thought. I knew I was going to college. In fact, my um, in high school, I worked my senior year at Eatonton Manufacturing Plant. Well, now this was the Enterprise Aluminum Company at the time, um, making pots and pans so that I could make money to go to school. Um, and I decided that I would go to college as long as I needed to go to keep from having to go back to Eatonton and work at Enterprise Aluminum Company. Uh, my first job was working outside in the summer painting an aluminum fence. And then I worked uh, on the assembly line. And, you know, while it was a wonderful developmental experience. It was um, something that I knew that um, I needed to make me know that I needed education in order to live the lifestyle um, I wanted and to get out of Eatonton, Georgia. Um, what was your question? <laughs> Were there any major moments or particularly influential people? Yes, there were. Um, so I grew up in St. John AME Church um, in Eatonton. And there were a lot of strong women in that church. There was one woman, Miss Frances Reed, and she'd come on the radio on Sunday mornings and do um, the community report on the radio. And then there was Miss Fanny Pearl Farley, who was over the women's auxiliary at the, um, at the American Legion. Um, and I was in the, young, the YPD, the Young People's Department, and uh, Miss Eileen Davis um, would um, guide us. And so I looked at these women, at these strong women who were doing things in the community, and I kind of shaped my life after them. Um, my personal home wasn't real nurturing or validating. Um, and so I found myself looking for validation outside of the home, and I became an overachiever because of that, just wanting um, others out that I admired to be able to say to me, you're okay, kid. <laughs> you mentioned that your father was in the military. Mm -hmm. um, how many different places had you been before you decide, decided to come back to Georgia? That's a really interesting question. So um, I started school in Omaha, Nebraska. So I went to kindergarten in Omaha, Nebraska. Um, an integrated um, kindergarten. Moved back to Eatonton for first and second grade um, segregated um, schools. Moved to Spokane, Washington, 
fourth, third, and fourth grade, fourth grade, my brother and I integrated the school. So it was an all-white school, and my brother and I were the only two black kids in the entire school. Um, fifth and sixth grade, we moved to Fort Campbell, Kentucky, an integrated school, um, very diverse, diverse. And then for seventh grade, moved back to Eatonton, um, and that was the year before the schools integrated. So it was a segregated school again. And then eighth grade, um, we integrated, um, Putnam County integrated in, in the school. I graduated from an integrated Putnam County High School. So I had an opportunity to see different parts of the world, of the country, um, actually. Um, an integrated environment, a segregated environment, um, to move and learn how to build friends and get along with people and make new friends. Um, so I, I think, you know, that experience really taught me uh, and gave me the strength of character that I have now and taught me how to relate to a lot of different people in various situations. How would you credit that experience for preparing you to be a student and or professor, just your your existence in the spaces of predominantly white institutions and also historically black institutions. Your childhood clearly prepared you for that, but were there any experiences that you weren't prepared for in some of those spaces? Well, yes. Um, as a child, you grew up wanting to fit in with your friends, right, and to be accepted by your friends. And I remember um, when we lived in Spokane, Washington, and I was the only little black girl in the school. And I remember the other little girls wanting to touch my hair. And I felt self-conscious because my hair was different. And I remember one night praying, when I said my prayers, that I would wake up the next morning and my hair would be straight like my friends. Because I did not know how to value um, who I was or what I looked like. I also remember during that time living in um, Washington, um, Martin Luther King was killed. This was in 1968. Um, and I remember the police coming to the parking lot where our apartment was. And there was another black family that lived in our apartment complex um, coming to, to make sure that we weren't going to cause, cause trouble um, because Martin Luther King was killed. And so that, that kind of shaped my um, perspective about my place in the world and how the rest of the world perceived me. And during that time, I looked up to Angela Davis. So when I was in high school and, and Afros were in, you know, I had, I had my Angela Davis fro and she was kind of my shero. Um, because I, I think I developed my sense of activism and um, sense of um, making sure that my voice is heard and other people's voices are heard during that time period. And so I've spent most of my life empowering others, while I also learned to empower myself, because this has been a journey of learning to value myself and know that I am enough. And that's what I want for other people also, to know that you are fearfully and wonderfully made and embrace who you are and live through that. I think that's the perfect segue into your experiences as CEO and your experiences um, in the nonprofit sector, which can be a very white dominated space. Can you share about what that is like with someone with all, with your vast spectrum of experiences and knowledge? What has it been like for you to be a trailblazer in this way? The first word that comes to mind is exhausting. <laughs> um, my first leadership position um, was at DuPont in Athens, Georgia. So when I was um, a student at the University of Georgia, the DuPont plant had um, an arrangement where the students basically ran the plant on the weekend. And so um, I, worked, I worked three jobs in college. One of them was at the plant. I was an RA and then um, I, worked as a security guard, believe it or not. <laughs> um, but six months after starting at DuPont, I got uh, promoted to supervisor in the warehouse. And so the guys that I was supervising were 
basically um, white guys who were older than me in a section of the plant where I had never even been, much less knew what they were doing. And here I am now, I'm their supervisor. So I just, I really just got thrown into the deep end for how to build relationships with people, build trust, and um, have them be able to respect me as their supervisor. Um, persuasion and influence skills that I had to learn, you know, real fast. And, um, and I did that. Um, when I was head of the School of Business at USC Aiken, um, being a business school um, dean is a predominantly male and predominantly white world. And so when I would travel around um, representing the School of Business at USC Aiken, I felt the need to establish my credibility every time I walked into the room so that they wouldn't see a stereotype that they might have had in their mind of a black female, um, that I could help change that stereotype and they could see a business school um, leader. So that was exhausting. And I probably put more pressure on myself than I needed to. Um, as a consultant, as an executive coach, um, I put pressure on myself also. I'm a, a contract coach with Emory University. I work with their academic leaders, and that includes the leadership of the medical school and the law school, and you know those in high power positions at Emory. And so you know, I remember thinking when I got that contract, they're never going to think that I know enough to help them do what they need to do. Well, 12 years down the road, um, I've established a reputation and you know, it's a lot easier for me to go in because I know that I know what I'm doing. But it's, it's um, feeling like you have to have yourself accepted by others because I really hadn't accepted my own level of expertise that I was bringing into the room. Um, so, you know, at 65 years old, I've come to accept that when I walk into the room, I bring something with me. Um, and so I'm less, less um, stressed or I worry less about whether or not I am going to be able to have the impact or the outcome that I want. Um, but it's, it's taken a while to get there. And it's been a journey of um, really um, self-validation and learning to understand my worth and what I bring to the table and not be defined by other people's definitions of what they think I should be because of what I look like. I mean, I went through the journey like a lot of black women do with what to do with my hair. So for a long time, when I was going on my executive coaching gigs, if I was going into a, a corporate environment, I would make sure that my hair was straight um, and not put on the uniform. And it's only been in recent years that I feel it's okay to wear um, curls, to wear African kinky hair, because um, it might not always be mine, but still <laughs> it's mine because I bought it, right? <laughs> but still, um, it's an ethnic look, and um, I'm okay with it, whether or not anybody else is okay with it. May I ask you how you decided to study psychology, <laughs> and how you decided to do work with me? So I actually wanted to be a surgeon. When, my, uh, when I was growing up, my grandmother and grandfather would fish all the time. And they'd take me fishing with them. And sometimes I'd come home and I'd be sitting at the kitchen table operating on the fish. So I would open the fish and I would dissect the eyes and I knew what, and I would just, I'd do surgery on the, on the fish. Maybe, I guess it was more like an autopsy because the fish was dead. Um, and I wanted to be a surgeon. And so I went off to the University of Georgia let me take a, a side road to get to, to the end of that. I wanted to go to Spelman. Really wanted to go to Spelman. I did not even apply to Spelman. Based on fear. And I, I use this story a lot of times to say a lot that fear holds us back from doing what we want to do. And that's why I'm passionate about helping people release their fear. And so I wanted to go to Spelman. I didn't apply because I didn't think I could live up to the mystique of the Spelman girl. Um, I knew I was coming from a poor family in Edenton. I didn't have the clothing or even knew how to have the look that I thought I should have as a Spelman girl. And I just didn't think I would be accepted. So I didn't apply. I applied to the University of Georgia, one school. That was the only school I applied to, and I was accepted. So um, that's where I went. Um, 
your question was about psychology, right? <laughs> okay, how did I get to psychology? I wanted to be a surgeon. I got to Georgia, and just all of my confidence that I might have had was just chipped away. Um, and so by the time I was graduating, I thought, well, maybe I'll just I'll go into physical therapy. I'll get a degree and then go to PT school. And I took a couple of psychology classes and loved it. Um, also, because at Georgia, I didn't have the confidence that I needed to have to um, strive for A's. Now, before I was admitted, I was invited to join the honors program in Georgia. I didn't because I didn't think that I could do, do the work. I, I'm first generation college, so I didn't have anybody in my background to say, go for it, you can do it. Um, so I didn't join the honors program, and I joined the crowd in college that said we were going to see our way through because that's all we thought we could do. So that's what we strove for. <laughs> well, around my senior year, I figured that um, if I'm going to graduate, I, <laughs> I can't go to medical school now because um, I didn't have the work ethic, and I didn't put the work in, and I didn't get into the right advisement group and that kind of thing. So I decided to major in psychology and um, loved it and learned that you had to go to graduate school to do anything with psychology. So my senior year, I had a 4.0 once I decided I needed to. And I finished um, at Georgia as a triple dog, um, bachelor's, master's, and Ph.D. in psychology. Um, it wasn't until my last year in my graduate program that I realized that I could have been finishing medical school had I believed more in me, um, but I think I'm in the right field. In light of what you shared, do you remember any reactions from family members as you were, since you were a first generation college student and you mentioned not feeling as affirmed um, in your childhood, how was this journey in college? in relation to your family back at home? Well, so there were members of the family that um, were encouraging. And um, it was mostly my mother who is late in life learning to love who she is. And it's hard to love the people around you if you don't love who you are. Um, but unfortunately, I was shaped <laughs> by that. And so I spent a lot of my life looking for validation that I'm okay, I'm smart enough, I'm good enough. And fortunately, the way I acted out that need for validation was by being an overachiever. So I figured if I'm at the top of the class, if I work hard, if I do this, I can gain approval. Well, I never came, but still, I, was, I ended up being at the top of the class and, and those kind of things. And so, um, and then there were some relatives that would, you'll find, I'm sure, that when you're around people who think you're just, you're really good, that the best in you comes out. Um, versus when you're around people who look down on you, the worst in you comes out. And so there were relatives who, um, some uncles, and they were all military. Um, and so I, I, I um, was affirmed by them and encouraged and nurtured by them. That was helpful. Were you able to share what you were learning with, what you were learning in your psychology classes and in this environment at school? throughout your undergrad and your graduate degrees, were you able to also make connections in your community? Were you able to connect what you were learning to what happened to you, to your relationships with family, and to the community that you grew up in? Um, okay, if I understand your question correctly, was I able to um, channel my learning so that I could use it to help others? Is that kind of what you're asking? Mostly, but more so, were you able to make sense of your, your world and things that may not have made sense before, but after your knowledge of psychology, you were like, oh, I see now. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. even with the black community at large, maybe. Um, not so much the knowledge of psychology, but through living and um, doing the work in the various institutions where I worked. And so I left USC Aiken and went to Benedict College um, because I was burned out. I was burned out. I had been in a predominantly white environment 
swimming upstream for years, being the first in so many situations, and it's exhausting. Um, and so I, I burned out. And when I got an, an opportunity to go to Benedict to a historically black college, I thought, yes. And I, my first day on campus, um, it was like taking off your shoes at the end of the day and not knowing how badly your feet were hurting. Um, so it was a healing process for me. And when I spoke to the, I was vice president for academic and student affairs, so I was number two at the college. And when I got a chance to speak to the entering freshman class, my first few months there, um, it was so much fun to look at them and say, when I was in school, sitting where you are, I was told, look to your left and look to your right. One of those students won't be here when you graduate, right? So I want you to look to your left and look to your right. Those are your brothers and your sisters. Y'all lock arms and make sure all three of y'all walk across the stage together. And that was the difference. And I had so much fun um, helping those students um, who came from backgrounds like mine to just believe in themselves and know where they could go. Um, and then I had the same opportunity to do that at Bennett College for women, except it was even better, my God, because it was black women. And so I had an opportunity to stand up there and say to them, the hand that rocks the cradle rocks the world. You are mothers. <laughs> you are shaping a generation. So I need you to be your best and do your best and go and shake up the world. And that was a wonderful experience. <laughs> So that is the perfect opportunity yeah. for us to talk about Delta. Yes. Do you have any family members that influence? How, how did you get involved or how did you know that you wanted to pledge? So I didn't know anything about sororities really until I got to the University of Georgia and I saw these women um, walking around campus with these Greek symbols on and they seemed to be so sophisticated and um, they were la having fun with each other and I don't have any sisters so um, they sit together in the dining hall and they um, have parties and I go to their parties and I thought I want to be one of them and the Deltas were the ones who were politically active on campus they were involved in student government and in the black student um, union and all and I said I want to be one of them and so in 1977 Spring of 1977, I pledged with 12 other amazing women, and um, we are still talking in group me as of last night, 44 years later, 45 years later. Yeah, we are still friends. One passed away, um, number eight, Betty, who was right in front of me. She passed away about five years ago. But the rest of us, they're living in the Atlanta area, and um, one lives down the street from me. And, you know, 45 years later, they're still my sisters. We're retiring. So five years ago, we were celebrating our 60-40 year. It, we were all turning 60, and it was 40 years in Delta. Um, that was an interesting year. This year, we're celebrating getting our Medicare cards. <laughs> And so we're having a chat and group me, well, which supplement plan did you sign up for? And um, that kind of thing, and, and grandchildren and things like that. So yeah, that's been an amazing, amazing opportunity in my life to connect with women like me. This may feel like backtracking, but I think that it fits with what you just shared regarding Delta's presence at UGA. Have there been has there been a time in your career where you risked something in light of you being an activist, true and true, and in light of you being an advocate? Have there been times where you've had to make hard choices? Yes, and it cost me a job. Um, two, two, as a matter of fact. Um, one hard choice was in a situation where there was sexual harassment and I grabbed my purse one day and walked off the job and said, no. Um, and it was really hard because my husband had just finished dental school and was not taking a salary yet, and I was the support for the family. And, and I walked off of a job where I refused to be subjected to, that, to those expectations, and I went home and had a mental breakdown. Um, went to a psychiatrist, was on Paxil, um, but before I could miss a paycheck, I got a call from my next job and said, we need you. That started me on a spiritual journey to know that God was watching me and paying attention. Um, so I'm very grateful for that process. The other um, situation where I was actually fired was because I spoke up 
um, to protect the, what I saw as an injustice for black women in the organization. And um, my boss, the CEO, didn't think it was appropriate. And so as a result of my having too much to say, I was dismissed. What I've learned along the way is that I am really not fit for mental management. <laughs> I'm not, I'm just not a good fit because um, I have ideas of what should happen and the way things should go. I'm more fit to, to be a CEO, to be a president. That way I can have a vision and then I can execute it and I can make it happen. And I don't have to try to drag other people along with me. Team members, yes, with like vision, but um, begging people and fighting people try to get things done. I've done most of my life, so I've decided that being in a situation of leadership where I can make the change happen um, is my most comfortable place to be. Can you share a, a moment when you, maybe one of the first times you decided to trust your instinct and your gut, even though um, it may have been very scary or men around you or people around you might have been telling you, no, this is the way or no, this is the right choice but you knew differently and you made that first um, pattern change to follow your own instinct as a woman. You know, I've never really thought about that, but I, I think the answer to that is at, after graduate school when I decided to go into higher education rather than to corporate America. So you heard me say I was working for DuPont um, and I did my internship in Wilmington, Delaware. Um, and so after I graduated as an industrial organizational psychologist, I actually could have gone to work for the DuPont company. Would have made a lot more money. Been retired now with a nice pension, um, but I wanted to have a family. And so I chose to go into higher education. My first job out of graduate school was teaching at Georgia College in Milledgeville. I made $25,000 a year um, with a PhD, but I had the flexibility to be with my daughter uh, Chanel and you know not have to work a nine to five with rigid hours if I needed to take her to class with me um, she'd sit in the back of the classroom with her crayons and color so I chose flexibility and the ability to, to raise a family um, and I ended up sacrificing salary um, and finances for that but I think I made the better choice do you think that your male peers have had to make similar decisions like what you just brought up regarding having a family? Oh, absolutely not. <laughs> Excuse me, hopefully he can delete, um, edit this out. Because the women are the primary caregivers in the family and we think about things like, well, and I was nursing a baby too when, when I, um, when I started my first job at Georgia College, I was nursing her So I uh, and, and with my son. I'd have to run and nurse them and then go back. Men don't have to think about um, being the primary caregiver for the children and making their, a place in the world for themselves. And I mistakenly adopted the perspective that I could do it all and I could have it all. And I about killed myself in the process trying. Um, and so I gave, 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 gave everything. Um, and didn't probably take enough time for reflection and to just to be quiet. I was going, going, doing, doing, breaking barriers, knocking, on, no, knocking down doors, um, and thinking that I had to be everything to everybody. So you know, if, I have, if I could go back to my, if I could write a letter to my younger self, I'd say, calm down, <laughs> just calm down, take more time to be, and you don't have to prove yourself to the world all the time. Um, just calm down, slow down, and let things happen instead of always trying to make things happen. I imagine so much of what you were working on had you so excited, though. So I want to ask you, what work have you been the most? Have, what work has excited you or um, reaffirmed that you're on the right path? That's a great question. So about um, 15 years ago, I took a course in neuro linguistic programming (NLP), 
And in that process, there's a, um, a process called timeline therapy where you learn to help people let go of stored negative emotions. And I remember when I went through the process and I was angry, um, my issues of abandonment with my father, lack of nurturing, all of that kind of stuff. I went through that process and all of a sudden I had a sense of peace and I was like, why doesn't the rest of the world know about this? And it became obvious to me that it was my job to do that. In fact, God said, it's your job to do that. So I wrote a book called Better Choices. And the book is actually the Letting Go program. And um, I built on that and that process and created a process called Reframing Therapy, which helps my clients release stored negative emotions like anger and hurt and sadness, um, guilt, self-doubt, their fears. And so every coaching relationship that I have begins with the process of doing a hard reset on our perspective. So in, um, in one of the first chapters of the book, the chapter is called Prisoners of Our Perspective. And so I'm so, I guess, honored that this information came through me <laughs> because I can't say that I'm brilliant enough. You know, I woke up with the, in the middle of the night with the, with the title Better Choices uh, for the book. And for, it's my, my company is the Better Choices um, group because everything we do in life is based on a choice, right? And our choices lead to our behavior, but our behavior stem back to our choices, our choices stem back to our feelings, and our feelings come from what we're thinking and the story that we're telling ourselves in our head. And so we can change the story, then we change what we're feeling, we change our choices, and we change the outcome. So through the process of reframing therapy, I help people to change the story that they're telling themselves. So at the end of the process, they know that they are enough. They know that um, they don't have to um, hold on to anger. They can learn whatever lesson the situation taught them, let go of the emotion, and do the forgiveness that's necessary. And so that's probably one of my proudest accomplishments is being able to work with my clients and help people walk away from a session with a sense of peace, with, with, with more um, self-love, um, and for having forgiven the trauma that they might have experienced in life. Um, you know, things happen. Life is not meant to be easy, um, and we can't change the past, but we can change what we think about it, and we can change how we feel about it so it doesn't define us, so that we can get the gift from each moment so that we can do the forgiveness that we need to and we can be wiser going forward. So that is what I give to people and that's probably my proudest contribution to other people's development. So I have seen a pattern and I struggle with self-sabotage and I think from knowing that struggle, I picked up on something in regards to racism and sexism among the community, would you say that your work would, I imagine because of the obstacles that so many women, so many black people and so many black women have faced or have heard about, there's a sense in which some of the time we shut ourselves out of opportunities or we avoid making certain choices <laughs> with the assumption that we won't be allowed to or that we're not good enough. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, actually, what would you say to the women going, deciding to take the same path as you, where the environment has changed, but there's still sexism and there's mm -hmm. still racism how do we make better choices or what advice would you give to your daughter or to other people coming in the, the same field of work as you okay um, that's a great question I would suggest that we remember that nobody can sabotage us more than we can sabotage ourselves that there's no degree of racism or sexism that can hold us back better than we can hold ourselves back because once we know who we are 
then um, we learn how to open doors and we learn how to make things happen. And so letting go of all of the limiting beliefs that we have about who we are and who we're capable of is the most important thing that we can do. You know, when you think about little toddlers, you never see a two-year-old with a self-esteem issue, do you? No, they know who they are, they're happy, and how dare you tell them no. No, this world is mine, that's mine, 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 mine. I mean, they, we have to teach them boundaries, but um, they're happy, they're confident, and so one of the things that I do in, in my sessions with um, my clients is to help them to go back, recognize, love, and appreciate the little person and see who they are, not who they were. But look at that, look at little Nefertiti. And she's two years old. Isn't she beautiful? Isn't she smart? Look at that big old heart. Now your job is to protect her, to protect all of that. And then I help them bring her home. Um, knowing who she is, loving who she is. And I think that is the greatest um, defense that we have against sexism or, or any of the isms. So I, lo I like to use the analogy that um, we are a light. And it's not just my analogy. Jesus said that we are lights, right? He said he was the light of the world and we are lights. And what happens in the deepest, darkest night if you light a match? The darkness falls away because darkness cannot stand in the presence of light. And the light doesn't have to fight the darkness. It doesn't have to try to convince the darkness. It just has to be what it is. And so if we can recognize that we are light and just be and bring that light into the darkness, we don't have to fight the darkness. We just have to be the light. Is there anything that you would do differently in retrospect? Um, I don't know. I think all of my experiences have made me the person that I am. Not having support, not having um, the nurturing has made me an independent person that forges. But I think life would have been a lot easier if I had um, allowed some people to help. Um, but I don't know. I don't know. With your faith and with your knowledge and, and even with what you mentioned with NLP, is that what it is, NLP? Uh -huh. Would you say that those things have influenced how hopeful you are? Yes. So I've worked with thousands of people over the years from guys who were getting paroled, who were serious and violent offenders, and I coached them before they were paroled into our community, to corporate CEOs, to women who were transitioning off of the welfare system and I did job coaching with them, to students who were um, chronic offenders, gangbangers in schools. Um, and what I found is that we have so much in common. I take the same approach with everybody. I ask, where do you want to go? What do you want for yourself? I help remove the barriers, the ways of thinking, the stories we tell ourselves, the programming, and then I teach them the skills that they need to get there. So people are people at all different levels. And my understanding that allows me to look at everyone through the lens of, with the Jesus eye, to know that we all have the potential to be good, we have the potential to be bad. Um, and that that helps. Now, the these past couple of years have been very difficult, and I'll have to be honest, on January 6th of um, 2020, um, 2021, um, after the year, so I think we all, we all prayed the year 2020. That's the year of clarity, right? Vision. And I think we got our prayer. I think we actually had an opportunity to see the world, not the way we hoped, it could be, but the way it actually is. Um, so I, with all of us praying for clarity, we saw it. And I was, so I was a little discouraged, a little angry and exhausted at what I saw. What I, you know, I'm looking at my neighbors through a different lens. And um, that was um, difficult and exhausting. something that 
something um, on your timeline in the past. Okay. Can you describe your younger self during one of your first major opportunities? What you thought, the choices that you made? Okay, first major opportunity. Well, you know, we moved around, so every school was a new opportunity to <laughs> do something different. Um, I remember being in fourth grade. This was at Butler Baker High School, the um, segregated school in Putnam County. And it, so it was a um, one through 12. All 12 grades were there in the school. Um, it was all black school. And I started playing clarinet. So I got to be in the band with the big kids. So I remember sitting on the bus. We took a trip, to, a trip to Fort Valley State because they had a band festival or something. And so I'm with this fourth grader, and there were 10th graders and 11th graders. So I thought I needed to fit in. So I said a curse word <laughs> because that would help me fit in. <laughs> and I remember getting chastised by the 10th and 11th graders like, does your mama know you talk like that? <laughs> So that um, that actually shaped me <laughs> in a way, in terms of not trying to fit in. <laughs> Ms. Yeah, they were going to think I was cool because I was a fourth grader and I could curse like they could, but no, <gasps> they slapped my little hand. <laughs> so funny. That was God too. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> awesome. If you could express your, the impact that you desire to be made from, the, from every aspect of your work, could you describe that for me, the impact that you want to have? Um, yes. And it's taken me a long time to be confident to put this out there because it's a big vision. So I've had the opportunity to help a lot of people release their stored negative emotions. I told you that. Um, the, the work that I'm doing helps with PTSD. It helps mitigate trauma. It helps people who have been through the worst situations in life um, reframe the way they see it, tell themselves a different story, and move past it with peace. So I see a day when Every soldier who gets deployed will have my process as part of their debriefing before they go home and abuse their families or commit suicide. I see every woman who gets raped or every child who gets abused, um, that a way to mitigate trauma is um, to sit through this reframing therapy process. And so it's like a penicillin for our emotions. We don't have to go through life harboring resentment. Um, or carrying these emotions. There's an easy and simple way to let go of it. And my job is to make sure that that work happens. Now, you might not know that I will be heading up the mental health unit in the hub. Um, okay, so Thrive will, is the name of the mental health unit. I'll be working with Harrisburg Family Health Care. And our goal is to have a trauma-informed approach to helping people who live in the area um, so that we can, because there's research has shown a clear connection between adverse childhood experiences, early trauma in life, and later on um, physical outcomes like heart disease and um, all kinds of physical ailments. And the CDC has um, published research that shows that most of the leading causes of death in this country lead back to early trauma. And so if when people come into the doctor's office, if we can screen them, to determine what trauma have you already experienced, and let's go ahead and mitigate that so that you're not taking it forward, you have a greater chance of seeing the world through a different lens, of maintaining your health. And so we want to uh, execute a model that can be used throughout the country, throughout the world, but we want it to start right here so that when everyone who comes into the clinic gets a trauma screening, they go through Thrive, our program of mitigating the trauma. We help them set some goals with this new perspective, and they can move on toward creating better lives for themselves and their families. Um, so that is my work for the, for the next, 
I'm 65. I plan to live till I'm about 100. So I've got about 35 more years um, <laughs> to do this. Um, for the next 20, I'll do it. And then for the next for 15 after that, I'll, I'll make sure that I'm teaching other people how to do it so that when I'm gone, um, the work is left behind me and the world has been changed because there is a way to help people without expensive hours and hours and hours of therapy um, for those who will seek it. Most people don't even seek help when they have a mental health issue. Um, so this will be my, my legacy to the world and my children. Um, I have two wonderful adult children, 37, my daughter, 31, and they're doing great things. I'm so proud of them. So, yeah. Can you tell me about this? So my daughter um, works for the water, stormwater department in uh, Richland County in Columbia, South Carolina. She's a stormwater educator, so you might see her on TV talking about not dumping into the, the, um, the storm, dump, what are the, the, um, the drains, the storm drains, yeah, and, um, and planting um, wetlands and, and things like that. She's having a great time with her environmental justice stuff. My son and his wife live in Alpharetta, Georgia. They are the ones that gave me my first grandson. He's 31. Um, he's a graduate of Hampton University. She's a graduate of Bennett College. And they just purchased Young Chefs Academy, which is a school, cooking school for kids. And he's doing great things, also working for Chase Bank. So I'm just really, really proud that ter they turn out to be great human beings. Yeah. I wanted to leave the last few minutes for you to share anything that you'd like to say. You may need a moment, but you can. I think, you know, if tomorrow was my last day on the earth, I'd like to think that I've lived every day to the fullest, that I have given more than I took that I have put service above self, and that um, when people come to my funeral, they will learn my, about my life based on other people that I touched. And so that's kind of my guiding principle. I see the world through spiritual, a spiritual lens. I try to live my life based on what Jesus taught. Um, and it's easy to make decisions which you know, when you know what you stand for ahead of time. Um, so I just, for the next 35 years, will hope to, st to maintain that, um, that course of action, that way of living. I thank you so, so much for your work and for your legacy and for being the kind of leader and the kind of advocate, activist, the kind of educator that I can look up to as I try to navigate this world and do work here in Augusta. Of course, we thank you. The Lucy Craft Laney Museum thanks you. And we're very, very excited about this series. You're the first. Oh, wow. You know, March is <laughs> Women's History Month. Mm -hmm. And so we're really wanting to highlight the women who have made contributions, some of which we'll never know about. But those those who have been doing such consistent and powerful work, we have to try to tell our stories. So I thank you so, so much. <laughs> well, I thank you, and I thank you for the work that you're going to be doing, because I know that you're a bright star, and if I can support you in any way, I'm here for you. <laughs> thank you so, so much. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. Oh, you're so welcome. <laughs> My nose was